Welcome again to the Keller Church of Christ with our Vacation Bible School for 2020, Paul's letter to the Keller Church. We're so excited to have you with us and perhaps you joined us on Sunday night with the lesson on joy and then Monday night on peace. And this evening we're going to talk about kindness as you open your Bible to Galatians chapter 5 and then tomorrow night we'll wrap up with the theme of love. How appropriate it is that we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit and those qualities in each of our lives that God develops as we walk with Him, cooperate with Him, as we walk in the light according to His Word. And I can't imagine a more appropriate topic than kindness. And so when I was given the opportunity, I said, that's the one I want to discuss because in this time of riots and violence and upheaval and chaos, anger and hostility and hatred, a huge dose of kindness could turn this whole world around. And it starts with Jesus Christ, with the Word of God, with the Spirit of God, and with you and me learning what kindness is and determining to put it into practice. We've heard of random acts of kindness. A person will grab a bag of peppermint candies and every time they see a person showing patience or thoughtfulness or gentleness or respect, they'll give them one of these candies. Or we'll hear about parking spaces and someone could go in and grab it, he's there first, but instead he motions someone else. Or it may be at the four-way stop, you go ahead of me. Or donuts and coffee that people drop off at the fire station to those that work to keep our communities safe, or the police station, or I think we're familiar with someone driving through a fast food line and paying for the customer behind them and just experiencing the joy and the thrill of doing something, giving generously, and yet not necessarily a large amount of money, just a bit of consideration. I learned of a man that received four Minnesota Timberwolves tickets as a Christmas gift. And when he got home, his wife said they already had a commitment for that night and couldn't go to the game. So they called a few friends. No one could use the tickets. And so this man went to his next door neighbor's home and they had a teenage boy. He said, how would you like to have four tickets to a Timberwolves game? He was delighted. He said, here's the deal. I'll give you $120 worth of tickets. If you will shovel the snow off this other neighbor's walkway and driveway all winter long. There was an elderly man living down the street. And so the boy eagerly took the tickets and kept his part of the arrangement. Everyone benefited. The giver, the receiver, and all the factors in between were better because one person thought of someone else. You hear of people that will buy cookies from the girls selling them in front of the store and they don't eat those cookies. They buy a lot of boxes and take them and distribute them to other people and that way the girls get the benefit of selling the cookies and the giver gets to give twice to them and to someone else. I thought as we began today we would talk about the song made popular by Glenn Campbell, actually written by Kurt Sapaw and Bobby Austin. If you see your brother standing by the road with a heavy load from the seeds he sowed, and if you see your sister falling by the way, just stop and say, you're going the wrong way. You gotta try a little kindness. Yes, show a little kindness. Just shine your light for everyone to see. And if you try a little kindness, then you'll overlook the blindness of narrow-minded people on the narrow-minded streets. Don't walk around the down and out. Lend a helping hand instead of doubt. And the kindness that you show every day will help someone along their way. You've got to try a little kindness. Yes, show a little kindness. Just shine your light for everyone to see. And if you try a little kindness, then you'll overlook the blindness of narrow-minded people on the narrow-minded streets. What is kindness? It's what Jesus called offering the cup of cold water. It's the sheep behavior in Matthew 25. I was 
sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was hungry. I was thirsty. You cared for me. I was a stranger and you welcomed me in. Matthew 25, 31 to 46. Kindness is what we offer to others that's undeserved. It's not forced or required. It's given to people that cannot repay in kind. In Luke 14, 12 to 14, the Savior described having people to eat that cannot invite us back. They're unable to reciprocate. Kindness is mercy, not meanness and not indifference, but showing attention with gentleness and compassion. It's that Samaritan in Luke 10, 25 to 37, who couldn't help but stop to help that Jewish man beaten up and left to die. And he showed him kindness. He bandaged his wounds. He put him on his animal. He took him to the inn and he paid his expenses. Kindness is thoughtfulness in action. It's usefulness for service. It's friendliness. It's a smile. It's a greeting. Jesus said in Matthew 5, don't just greet those that greet you or love those that love you or give to those who can give back to you, but show yourself to be children of your Father in heaven. He sends the rain on the just and the unjust. He lets the sun shine on everybody. Your Father is kind, Jesus said, even to the ungrateful. And we demonstrate that He lives within us and we're walking with Him. We reflect Him when we show kindness to the ungrateful, to those that in some ways may be unlovable or unworthy. Kindness, it's soft words and actions. It's turning the other cheek. It's helping the helpless. It's treating other people as God has treated us. Galatians chapter 5, think about the background leading up to the call to bear the fruit of the Spirit, which includes kindness. We may be surprised that even in the early church, there were issues related to selfishness and pride and irritation of one against another. And so the Bible says in Galatians 5.13, you're called to liberty, but don't use that liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, that is to serve your own desires, but through love, serve one another. And then verse 15, but if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. Well, those words just jump off the page to me, but I, I think these are, these are followers of Jesus. Why do they need to be told not to bite and devour, that they might consume one another? And then I think about our lives today, and this is a struggle that perhaps all people have, even God's people, and that is in this time of impatience and aggravation and stress and pain and fear and difficulty with the virus going on and then this turmoil throughout our nation. It's easy to, to, to attack. It's easy to insult. It's easy to, to talk against and slander others and try to hurt them. And somehow people think that makes them feel better. So we need Galatians 5, 15, and then we need 16. Walk by the Spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. The two are against each other. And there's this war in your life and mine between what the old devil would have us do and what God challenges us to become. Led by the Spirit, verse 18. And then he says in verse 26, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Well, that sounds like verse 15 all over again. Pride, arrogance, haughtiness, threatening one another, bragging about ourselves, getting this pecking order, the competition and comparison that just eats away at the soul. And then, of course, chapter 6 goes on to say, Brothers, if one of you is caught in a trespass, those who are spiritual restore such a one 
in the spirit of gentleness. So throughout this passage, we have this contrast between the flesh and the spirit. And right in the middle, we have the deeds of the flesh are evident. Chapter 5, 19, you can read those. But the fruit of the spirit, 22, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. There's so many illustrations all around us of kindness. I'm reminded of people here in the Keller Church of Christ that are looking for little ways, simple things, not costly expressions, but things that show I'm thinking of you, I'm praying for you, care about you. Sometimes it's a bag of cookies that one of our members will drop off at the homes of others. Or it's chalk written on the sidewalk with an encouraging message. Or it's a note in the mail that just says, I appreciate you. I love you. I'm asking God to bless you today. It's a phone call. It's a text message. It's something on social media. I see this going on more and more and more in this congregation. And I believe, and I'm sure you'll agree, that in times of stress and anxiety, such as we're facing right now, kindness becomes even more apparent and powerful and influential. And I notice even interacting with people in the community. Yes, there are those that are harsh and rude and rough, but there are those that recognize during this time we need each other to support, to care, to listen, to protect, to watch out for one another. I learned of a man that lived on an Air Force base and he and his friends cut off somewhat from their families and their daily routine, thought to themselves, what can we do to lift the spirits of everyone here? And so they've put a hat out and they write down on slips of paper ideas. Every time they thought of something that might help their community at the base, they would drop that in there. And one of them was to write inspirational quotes on posters and put them around the Air Force base. Well, they spent maybe an evening and wrote down some things that they had heard, they were aware of, perhaps they gave them a boost. And then they uh, uh, set these in spots where other people could see them. Or they would put together just a very small gift, not costly. And they'd take it to the hospital and they'd say, give this to the family of the next baby that's born. Or take this to the room of a sick child. And they insisted that it be anonymous. They would never even know who received the benefits of what they did. I've told the Keller congregation before about the teddy bear lady. It's a favorite story of mine. A woman that would go and visit the hospital where children were sick and she would bring a teddy bear and give it to them and visit with their parents. What nobody knew at the time was that this woman was very wealthy. And as she would listen to their needs, she would then come up with a way to help them pay their hospital bill. And anonymously, a gift would come in and assist that family. But again, kindness isn't a matter of a large dollar amount. Just a little bit of thoughtfulness, consideration, generosity, it's a word, it's a smile, it's a contact that we make. Where would you go in the Bible to see a powerful example of kindness that changed the lives of all that it touched? I'm opening, and I hope you will, to the book of Ruth. Because here we're going to see how Naomi, through her faith, influenced her daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth, and her compassion and interest in them when first Naomi's own husband died, and then her two sons that were married to these women died. And Naomi 
When she heard there was bread back in her homeland of Bethlehem, she told Orpah and Ruth, you stay here. I don't have another son that could be your husband. Both of those daughters-in-law offered to go back with her, but Naomi said, maybe best for you to stay here. And as you know, Orpah did stay, and we learned nothing more about her. But Ruth clung to Naomi. And she said, don't entreat me to leave you or return from following after you. Wherever you go, I will go. I'll lodge where you lodge. Your God will be my God, your people my people. Nothing but death will separate us. And so she went with Naomi. So who showed kindness to whom? Naomi treated Ruth as her own daughter. Ruth responded in the very same type of love and thoughtfulness. She was going to support, be at the side of, and assist Naomi going to a new land as a Moabitess, a stranger. Historically, the Moabites were enemies of the people of Israel. And yet Ruth, through Naomi's influence, had come to acknowledge Yahweh, the one true God, and was prepared to go and do whatever she could. Well, you know that in chapter 2, Ruth came and there was the field. The Bible says, and I love this, that she happened to come. Literally, the Hebrew text says, her chance chanced upon the area that belonged to Boaz. And Ruth demonstrated that kind servant spirit Give me a job, whatever it is, I'll do all that I can to give it my very, very best. This is verse 2 of chapter 2. Let me go to the field. Let me glean heads of grain after him in whose sight I may find favor. And so verse 3 is the passage I mentioned. She happened to come uh, to Boaz's field. And now notice Boaz's kindness. He said to his reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered him, the Lord bless you. What a contrast this is with Judges, the preceding book that covers some of the same period of time. But in Judges, it's all about uh, fighting and invasion and attack. And we need a leader to come and kill these people. Now we switch over to Bethlehem and it's a farm in which people speak kindly. To each other about the Lord and they welcome each other and so Boaz learns about the Moabite woman named Ruth and he offers her verse 8 calls her my daughter stay close by my young women let your eyes be on their field and you'll be safe he says basically from the men and so she says why have I found favor to you and he says we've heard about all of your efforts all that you've done how you left your father and your mother in the land of your birth look at verse 12 may the Lord repay your work and a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel now look at verse 13 Ruth said, let me find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I'm not like one of your maidservants. I'm not worthy. I don't deserve to be here. And yet you've spoken to me with such compassion, such unselfish interest, such willingness to invest in my situation. Now, where this Bible, New King James Version, says you spoke kindly, the Hebrew text literally says you spoke to the heart. And that's what kind words are. It's something we can't put on. We can't fake. We can't pretend. Kindness is from the inside out. And we can't just decide, I'm going to say something kind today. I'm going to do something kind. It is our nature. And that's why it's the fruit of the Spirit this is a character, this is a quality that grows and develops as we walk with God. Anyway, she gleaned in the field. And I want you to notice verse 20 where Naomi said to Ruth when she came back, Blessed be he of the Lord, that's Boaz, blessed be Boaz, who has not forsaken his, what, 
kindness to the living and the dead. The name Naomi in Hebrew means pleasant. And yet because there was famine in the land of Moab where she was, because her husband died and both of her sons died, when Naomi, whose name means pleasant, came back home to Bethlehem, she said, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, which is Hebrew for bitterness. Because Yahweh, the Lord, has dealt bitterly with me. So in the story of Naomi, we see a woman who was pleasant. She had husbands, sons, daughters-in-law. Then bitter, famine, widowhood, bereavement. And now she comes back home and people say, could this, could this be Naomi? Is that really she? She looks so different. We can imagine she's disheveled and she's wrinkled and she's weary and she's worn. Now, through the kindness of Ruth and the kindness of Boaz, what happens in this bitter woman's life? You know, a marriage takes place between this generous, wealthy, extended relative of the family, Boaz, and Ruth, this Gentile from Moab. And as a result, the people come around them in chapter 4 and wish them all the blessings of the Lord and that their family might grow and multiply. And a son is born. And a couple of generations later, there's Jesse. And then Jesse's son, David. And so the book of Ruth closes with the name of the great king. After Saul, the first king, there would be David. And look how God would use this man after his own heart to lead and save and protect his nation. And ultimately, you're right, Ruth the Moabitess is an ancestor in the line of Jesus Christ. And so Matthew chapter 1, which gives the Lord's genealogy and names several women each one interesting in her own right includes Ruth and this non-Israelite, not a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is part of God's outworking of all the things that brought Jesus into the world. I love the book of Ruth. I know that so many of you do also. It teaches me that kindness begins at home and that in order to be a kind person, I want to treat my wife, husband, children, parents, siblings, grandparents. I want to show them this attribute first. I want my spouse to think I'm the kindest person that he or she could have married. I want my children to see that, yes, dad may be firm at times, but dad has a tender side, a thoughtful side, uh, an inviting part of his character. It shows me, too, that kindness is always my choice. I can be kind no matter what other people have done or currently do or will do. And that's why Jesus said, your heavenly Father is kind to those that are ungrateful, to those that reject Him, to those who are His enemies. There's one more incident from the Old Testament I'd like to mention as we have opportunity. If you open your Bible to 2 Samuel chapter 4, you will see that during this time of transition in Israel, after Saul, the first king, and his son Jonathan had died in battle, and while David is rising to power on the throne, there is a grandson of Saul, son of Jonathan, named Mephibosheth. 2 Samuel 4, 
who was injured when he fell during a quick escape as he was very young and he was lame, crippled in both feet. Now turn over to 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel 9. Years have passed and David asked the question, is there anyone in Saul's family to whom I can show kindness for the sake of Jonathan? Jonathan had been his best friend. You know how close they were to each other. Saul had departed from the Lord, but David had a bond with Jonathan. Is there anyone from Jonathan's family to whom I could show kindness for his sake? Well, there is this Mephibosheth. And next thing you know, this man is invited to share in the king's feast at his table. To share in the king's fellowship as they bond together. To share in the king's fortune as he's granted all the things that had belonged to Saul and to share in the king's family. As David said, from now on, you will be as one of my own sons. Well, Mephibosheth was shocked. Why? I mean, he was disabled. He couldn't contribute. He couldn't give back. He couldn't add anything to what David was offering him. But what David did for Mephibosheth, he did for the sake of Jonathan. Now, fast forward to the New Testament. Ephesians 4 and verse 32. We are to be kind to one another, forgiving, understanding, gentle and thoughtful. Why? For the sake of the Lord. Because when we were sinners, when we were lost, when we were helpless, Jesus Christ offered the ultimate act of kindness when he went to the cross. David asked, to whom can I show kindness for the sake of Jonathan? You and I ask, to whom can we show kindness for the sake of Jesus Christ? And it's not that we're looking for someone that's worthy or who did something for us or will do something for us. You see, it's not really about Mephibosheth, whomever we might help. It's about our Lord and our Savior, whom we love. It's what He has done for us that transforms our heart from the inside out and redirects us into the way we see ourselves and we see people. And we want them, as David wanted Mephibosheth, we want others to share the king's fortune, the king's fellowship, the king's feast, and the king's family. Kindness. It's the fruit of the Spirit. May you and I grow in our relationship with God so that those seeds in our lives may develop and mature and we may become more and more those who are known in this harsh and rough and violent world we're known as people of kindness. Thank you again for joining us in this study in our Vacation Bible School 2020 with the Keller Church of Christ as we're considering Paul's letters to the Keller Church of Christ. And tomorrow night, Wednesday night, we'll hope you will join us again for a final session on love, which binds it all together. That love that God first demonstrated to us that we can now reflect and offer to others. Thank you again for joining us.